I would love to hear a little bit more about your story into coaching because you've had this full diversified career before you came into coaching. So I don't walk me through a little bit of the journey and like, where did the light bulb come in for coaching? And then the shift into it happened. Yeah. Target was the first entry into my professional career. And that's when I learned how to lead large teams in a fast pace, a uh, very yet fun and friendly culture. And then after that, I got into consulting. I was, I got burned out from retail. I moved eight times in 12 years. I missed six Christmases in a row with my family. I missed weddings because I didn't want to have to work two weekends in a row. I was making, and now I know it was because I was burnt out and I needed the weekends and the evenings to just re-energize. And there was a moment in my last job as director of operations for this commercial real estate company in Chicago. It was 2023 and I was six months into the role and I was overwhelmed. It was a brand new industry. It was a different culture. I was stressed and I knew I was feeling all these things inside. And I took myself to the ER one Friday afternoon of chest pains. And I even told my husband, I said, stay home. I know this isn't a heart attack. I know what this is, but just for peace of mind, I've got to go and make sure my heart's okay. And I came back and everything was fine from that perspective. And he looked at me and he said, you're not the person that I married. And I'd only been married three years, maybe at that point. And I said, what do you mean? And we talked through it. And I said, you know what? I need to get help. I, I know that I was working through the anxiety, the stress, and I've always been able to show success at work, but I didn't know how I was projecting that. And so I just partnered with resources. I went to my doctor. I said, what can I do from a healthy perspective? Because I certainly wasn't eating healthy. I didn't have time to eat. And if I did eat, I was eating at my laptop. And then I got a business coach and they helped me change my mindset. And how can I better orchestrate my life at work and at home to meet the needs of my family, myself, and my job? And we talked through some ideas and I implemented them at work. I reorged my organization. And 18 months later, I ended up leaving it to open my own coaching practice. So I didn't know it at the time, but I think that was really the pivotal moment was that the man that I love looking in my eyes and saying, hey, something's not right here. And that I needed to do something about that. And the commonality of all my roles were people, my love of finding talent, developing talent, finding someone who could be my boss someday. I like enjoyed that. There wasn't any pride in that for me. And it was always just a small part of my job. And I wanted it to make, I wanted that to be all of my job. And so that's what brought me to being a coach. Wow. It's interesting too, that coaching is such a it's such a funny practice just where we started this call. It's like an unregulated industry and nobody knows what it is. And it's, everybody calls themselves a coach and there's every flavor of coaching. Yeah. Um, and I think sometimes when people hear it, it feels woo, <laughs> but I think it's hard for people who are coaches because the story is so often the experience that we've had from it, the impact that it made on our lives that made us want to go in and give that impact to other people. So it's interesting to hear how big of a role it played in you shifting. Do you think you would have gotten there because you had that moment with your partner, but do you think you would have gotten there without the support of coaching? Yes. Yeah. I think I would have. I've been arguably coaching and and developing people for almost 30 years now. And I'm just now doing it in a way that is backed by science and psychology. It's so rooted in psychology. And that's why I felt like I needed to get certified because I didn't know a lot about psychology. Even people go to school for eight years to be a psychologist and I'm by no means a psychologist. But through that journey, I'm now learning about brain health and things that you can do 
not only the things that you put in your body, but what breathing can do for you. And I heard that for years. Meditation, people have been trying to throw that at me for years. Still not a meditation person, but I have seen results and proof in the breathing, in the journaling, in the activities such as a vision board, just talking one-on-one -on -one with somebody in a, tr a trusted environment where you're not being judged. I've lived it and it's worked for me. And I wouldn't be able to do this if there wasn't proof in that for me. And so that's, I guess that's the operations person in me and the compliance person in me. I like facts. Um, and I like to hear about what can truly help you change your mindset and think differently and how that can impact your wellness at work. How do you think about what you do and who you help? I think about wellness as holistic wellness. And most people I think organically just go to how am I feeling health wise? Am I spiritually content? And a lot of people don't think about workplace wellness in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And there is a really fine line between how you show up at work and how you show up in life. And so my focus is on business professionals who are looking to understand them, themselves, their emotions, their decisions better to meet their expectations in their professional goals and those of the organization. And so business coach, executive coach, whatever you want to call it, it is really focused on those people who want to have a better understanding of how they do what they do. And it runs the gamut of things. Life does certainly dictate how you make decisions with your spouse or your significant other is in a lot of ways the same way that you would approach challenges and opportunities at work. What does that mean exactly? Like how, how you work versus where you work, the behavior piece of it? Yeah, there's a lot of behavioral assessments out there in the marketplace. I've done people finders, the Bergman method, and there's a lot. And DISC is something that I was introduced to about 25 years ago when I started my career at Target. I was right out of college. I was selected to be part of their store director program. And at 28, I was managing my own store, opening a new Target in Chicago. And part of that process was to sit down with a psychologist and take a DISC assessment to make sure that you were mentally and fit for a role where you're managing a $40 million business and over 200 people. And Target used it as a succession planning tool back then. So no one sat up, sat with me one-on-one -on -one and said, here are the results of the disc that you took, which would have been so like empowering to me. So I didn't really know much about it back then. And then I was reintroduced to it about two years ago when I was working with a business coach. And what it does is DISC stands for four very normal behaviors that everyone has. There's dominance, there's influence, there's um, steadiness, and then there's compliancy. So when we look at how you respond in the workplace, dominance is how you respond to people and challenges. I is how you influence others to your point of view. The S for steadiness is how you respond to the pace of your environment. And then C is compliancy. So how do you respond to rules and regulations set by others? And so it looks at how you show up naturally, the real Jenny that's not going to change, and then how you adapt in the workplace across those four behaviors. And so I know what I learned about myself is I had all, always selected fast paced environments in which to work. I went from retail to consulting for a global consulting firm to commercial real estate. And I thought that was the way to get noticed, to get promoted, uh, to meet my goals. And I am naturally a very slow paced person. I knew I was methodical and I knew I could adapt to a faster paced environment, but I didn't know that it was going to burn me out at 48 years old. Hmm. And I may have made different choices in my career had I known how I show up naturally and how I was responding to my environment. Like at Target, when I was 25, 26, taking this behavioral assessment, 
I think I would have been surprised at how I show up naturally because I was always liking and that fast paced environment and a different day every day. But yeah, it's interesting. And then how do you adapt to that? The more you adapt, the more stress it takes on you. It's a tool that it takes. And so when I coach my clients and we get a, the results in this, we look at, okay, what 12 workplace behaviors that are very common in the workplace, such as urgency or competitiveness or people focused, customer focused, what is very easy for you and what takes intention, which takes your energy. It's really eye-opening and enlightening when someone can sit down with you one-on-one -on -one and really make sense of it as you're looking to get into the career market. Or even if you've been doing this for 30, 40 years and you're a CEO, there's so many things you can learn about yourself. And, and all of that translate, it translates into being a better leader is what I have found. Oh, there were so many juicy things in there. <laughs> oh, where do I, which direction do I go? What, one thing I think is interesting is you said, I took that assessment very early on, but nobody sat down and interpreted it with me. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you got your results or not. And then you said, I might have made different choices. And so I guess I'm curious for you or for the clients that you work with, do does making different choices mean, okay, now I'm going to think about how do I adapt my behavior or how do I recover if I'm in an environment that's not really suiting my preferences? Or does it mean taking yourself out of that environment and choosing one that's better aligned? Or it could be any of those options. Yeah. And it could be any of those. And there's not one right disc, like, or no disc assessment, whatever the results are wrong. And what people really need to understand is, yes, could I maybe infer through the results that there is a job conflict? Maybe. Maybe there's even a me conflict that they're really not aware of what their strengths are, what their opportunities are. And so how can we do a better job of integrating that into the work that they're doing? And then there's techniques around that, like the things that don't come naturally and are causing you stress. Can you delegate them? Are you, do you have the opportunity to do that? And if you don't, can you reward yourself for finishing that project or making a presentation and delivering it to a client because it doesn't come naturally? What can you do to reward yourself for that? So we look at practical techniques whether it's in their current environment or do we need to dig in and go back to what are your values? What are your purpose? What do you want out of the next five, 10, 20 years? Is it early retirement? Is there a fancy sports car you're working toward? Like whatever that is, let's look at that and look at where you are now and then figure out together what your options are. A lot of people only think they have maybe one or two options. They're in an industry for 20 years like I was thinking that's all I know. But that's the fixed mindset that we have to get ourselves out of and get back in more into that growth mindset, gain that confidence, do away with that imposter syndrome and say, you have a set of skills and competencies that can transfer across industries. Maybe you have a choice to do another industry. Maybe your choice is to go out on your own. Maybe your choice is to stay where you are, but to reorg your environment so it meets the needs and demands of your clients and gives you peace and joy in what you're doing. You mentioned DISC as just one assessment out of many that you've you know, either taken or trained in. Yeah. And I'm curious, there's a lot of criticism sometimes out in the world around assessments and what's the validity of them and what to do with them. My take is take out of it what's useful and leave the rest. What matters most is your interpretation of the results and what do you want to do with that information? What's your take on if you use other assessments beyond DISC? Like how do you really like to use that one or where do you see it being most powerful in terms of application for, for clients? That's a great question. So Assessments are a shortcut for the coach and the coachee. What you get out of an assessment could translate to a year of conversations, regular sessions with the client to find out some of these 
amazing insights about, again, how they're working or what their strengths are or what their tendencies are at work. And it's a, for DISC, it's 15 minutes to take. Um, so it's a short period of time. It's not a time commitment. And it is an amazing shortcut to, again, what would take quite a bit of time to understand just through organic conversations and questions. So that's what I love. So even if they don't do DISC, if they've done something, I'm like, I'm send it to me because I'm going to learn a lot about them. And maybe they need some interpretation of that. Maybe that didn't land very well with them. Or like you said, if they're really bothered by a word or a phrase that the assessment said, let's change the word. If it's egotistical, what's a better word for you to really buy into that? And then move on if it really isn't landing. So at the end of the day, they're the ones doing the work. It's their journey. It's not mine. And I give them access to the tool and they can choose again what to do with it or how to use it. I'm curious for DISC too. I know with the StrengthsFinder assessment, people have a tendency to go to the bottom of the list. So it's okay. There's 34 strengths. I'm going to look at what 34 is and really be like, why is that my lowest or have judgment or criticism around that? Are there any nuances to DISC like that where people get their results and they overly want to focus on particular areas versus others? Yeah, I typically take a list of 12. I believe there's 12 strengths in there and they get the assessment before we have our debrief. And my debrief is anywhere from 90 minutes to two hours, just depends on how the conversation goes. And if we want to break that up or if we want to do it in one session. And I say, let's focus on the top three that really resonated with you. And those things that are resonating are usually what's top of mind or something that's happening in, in their workplace that they can easily speak to. It's theirs to seek holistically what this assessment is. But when we talk through it, we really talk about the points that are resonating with them. And then we move on. And same with, I don't like the word weaknesses. I like opportunities or challenges. And then the other thing that I really love about DISC and what DISC does is it shows under extreme or moderate stress, how you're perceived by others. And that usually is a very controversial or provocative page to go over with people because there's a lot of strong words that are used there. But a lot of people know how they're feeling on the inside. They're feeling that stress. They're feeling the anxiety, overworked, whatever it might be, but they don't know how they're projecting that to others. And so it's a really insightful page for us to say, okay, what techniques can you do if you're feeling yourself stressed? First, how does that present with you? Did your face turn red? Does your heartbeat start beating fast? Whatever those indicators are. Now, what can we do to remove yourself from the situation? Take some deep breaths before you go and continue the conversation. So you can take that emotion out of it. And that's where I think a lot of people don't spend a lot of time thinking about the emotions and, and how you're perceived by others when you're under a lot of stress. Hmm. Give me an example of what does that mean in terms of how you're perceived? What, what is something somebody would see on the page? So if someone is moderately stressed, they could come across as impatient, sometimes egotistical. That's a word that shows up. If I look back at what my disc said, I think I tend to be quiet. Some people tend to be more talkative, but there are other things too, in terms of it compares how you are perceived by others with no stress. So it really starts there. So if you're under no stress, how are you perceived? Are you perceived as someone who has high influence? Are you perceived as calm, friendly, whatever those words might be? And then it takes you through moderate stress and extreme stress. And when people are under stress, their behaviors tend to change. Their emotions tend to change. And everybody, I think, has a physical reaction to stress, that they really listen to themselves. They can do a lot with that because changing behavior requires understanding the reasons behind it in the first place. So if you know that financials and spreadsheets stress you out, we talk about that. What can you do to alleviate that stress? You can set 
maybe your um, calendar off and put yourself in a private room where no one can bother you and just light a candle or whatever their answers come to be because it's all about finding their answers within them. It's not about me telling them what to do. But that tends to be a, a place in, in the assessment that we spend a lot of time. Yeah, I'm, I'm like going into my mind of thinking like, okay, without the assessment, because I've never taken it before, do I, have, am I bringing the self-awareness to the table of how do I, how am I generally perceived? And I think I have a fairly accurate idea of that might be different for different contexts of people. And how do I show up when I'm stressed? And I can immediately think about, okay, I could recount some differences there. I'm curious for people who are taking the assessment, are they sometimes coming in with a level of self-awareness as well? And so that's helping them put language to it or see it from a different light, or is it sometimes just groundbreaking information for people where they're like either lacking that self-awareness or just have never, never even thought about that before? Uh, the majority of my clients and the people that I talk to, even potential clients, they say they have a level of understanding of their self-awareness. Only 10 to 15% of the population, though, actually meet those requirements of self-awareness, which is a study I think I found on LinkedIn one day, and I did a post on that, actually. And so I found that really interesting. And so... While there is a general understanding of what, who they are, how they respond, how they communicate, there is also some aha moments that they take a step back and think about. And I said, well, if you want validation to that, go ahead and take this page that talks about your weaknesses and how you respond in stressful situations. Take it to a friend, take it to someone at work and have them validate the results. And I think that's very powerful too. But something you said when it comes to DISC and the value of it, it's not only understanding your self-awareness, but it's how can you communicate with people who have a different working style than you, who have a different communication style. And the biggest mistake I made as a brand new leader, and I constantly see in even seasoned leaders, like I have a CEO that I did a disc with, they think that others have to adapt to them. This is their company. It's very successful. It's going well. They need to adapt to how I work instead of, no, it's actually the complete opposite. You have five direct reports. You need to adapt to their style in order to get the results that you want. And everybody adapts. So there's gonna be adaption coming from every angle, but for leaders to truly understand that also comes out in DISC. And you, I even do DISC workshops with teams because leaders want to know, am I balanced in my team? Is the reason why we're not getting work done is because I have too many people who are people oriented and not enough people who are task oriented or the reverse. Maybe you have a poor culture because everyone's focused on task and there's no one there focused on team and culture. And that can be very eye-opening too. And then we sit down and we talk about, okay, now that you know that this person has this communication style, what are some do's and don'ts? So do you email that person differently? They don't want paragraphs. They're not going to read your email if they open up their email and it's three, four paragraphs long. How can you bullet point that or make it more of a summary? And at the end of the day, doing that is going to get you the results that you're looking for too, which is an answer, a response to an email. Hmm. Yeah, it, it makes me smile a little bit. I think about there, I was in a work context a number of years ago. And as a team, we we did the strengths finder assessment. And regardless of what assessment it is, I, to your point, I think it's helpful to have a shared language that everybody's coming to the table with. And so we we did that assessment and it was very enlightening to me around a conflict that I was having with my team because we had recently had some shifts where there we had a three-person team where there were like two people, myself included, who were a little bit more thoughtful and slow and deliberative 
to approach a task and we had one kind of command person who was like, let's take action and go. Then we shifted the triangle to two people who were take action and go. And I was the only deliberative person that kind of like, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> let's think about it before we make this decision. Yeah. And I was really frustrated before I had that context and I knew it. I was like, something is really off. Like I'm in this work context, like I was happy. Now I'm really frustrated, but I don't know why exactly. And that just really opened up like, oh, okay. Now I see what's happening. The dynamic totally changed. And now I have to think about, especially because there was a little bit of a power dynamic. I was the bottom person on the totem pole, okay, now I need to find a way to influence my leader and influence my peer to be more slow and thoughtful, to slow them down. And then I had to try a bunch of different strategies to find out which one worked to slow it down a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but I share that example to say what I notice happen in these contexts where a team comes in or even a person comes in and they get more information is they might have insights for a moment, ahas, but then they put the assessment in a drawer, mm -hmm. they don't think about it again, or the lift to make the shifts and put in the effort is just so high that I'm just going to keep doing the thing that I want to do because all of that is really a lot of extra work. I don't know. Do you see that too? Where it's, it's not the assessment, it's not even the self-awareness, it's the implementation of what you learn. That really is where the, the juicy good results happen. And that's true. And, and every time that I go into a conversation, when a leader asks me, I'm interested in doing a team disc, I ask them what their goals are, because I find that if the leader isn't bought into what those results are. And it's usually when there is a conflict, that's when people are wanting or interested in those assessments, or you're starting a brand new team. You want to get some critical insights early on in the process. I have a, a package where I actually will continue coaching and holding them accountable to that. And the leaders are more than happy to invest in that. They invested in the disc, they invested in the workshop, they want to, they're invested in changing the behaviors of the team to meet the team goals. And the best way that I can describe it, and I, and I go back to that CEO that I referenced before, he's very much the opposite of you and opposite of me. We're high influence, very methodical thinkers, and he's very high in dominance. And he tended to unintentionally devalue those that were not the same working style as him. And he kept referring to himself as like the captain of the ship. And I said, let's put it in an analogy of you're the captain, let's say of an airplane and you just care about destination. That's what, you, and how to get there. But you need someone on your team to figure out how are we gonna get the people there? What time are they going to board? When we're on the plane, who's gonna get them excited about where they're going and what their experience is going to be and who's going to make sure there's gas to fill the plane on the way back. Those are things that you're not going to think of. And so it does, it made him, for example, take a step back and say, okay, in those moments, and he had an example of when he made a rush judgment to a decision and it did not land well, what he could have done. And it was bringing in his operations person who's more methodical and curious and ask questions and he realized that is something that he could do the next time he was hiring, excuse me, for that role. So I think just him surrounding himself with potentially yes people too was a potential mistake that was being made with how he was reacting to people who had a different working style than him. So yeah, it's fun. Those disc assessments, I have a lot of fun doing those. And one of my techniques too is at the end of the debrief, I have them take on a, looks what do you call it, a postcard. <laughs> and I said, okay, what one behavior do you want to change in the next 30 days? Be very specific. How does it look? How does it feel? How does it smell? And put your address on it. I'm going to mail it to you in 30 days. And we're going to have a follow-up conversation to that. 
So accountability is huge. Usually leaders who invest in it, just to get back to your original question, are looking for a partner to help them build the skills and competencies of their team. I like that idea of sending the postcard, like anything to increase accountability. And we all can benefit <laughs> from accountability, especially when it's the hard stuff where it's okay, I have to change something. I have to go against my natural grain or not in the right context in terms of an environment where I thrive, but I do want to stay here for whatever reason. And so I need to be really intentional about rejuvenating or taking action to shift those things to fit into the environment. And it's, it's hard when you're trying to make those shifts. Yeah. There's a lot leaders these days. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of reduction in workforce. Companies are asking you to do more with less. There's this return to office debate. COVID, I led through COVID. That was a beast in and of itself. And so it really does take someone who understands and who's been through those situations too. And one of the things that when we were chatting earlier about my coaching as a business coach, what I bring that, I don't know if it's a differentiator, but it's unique, is that I get it. Like I have that wisdom, that experience. I've been laid off. I've transitioned industries late in my career. I've led a team of 800 people through COVID and returned to office. And it's not easy. And I've always led through empathy and honesty. And that's how I coach as well. And I may, you may not hear what you want to hear, but I'm going to be honest with you about that. And I think that's the best compliment I ever got from one of my clients is that he's, you didn't tell me what I wanted to hear. You told me what I needed to hear. And it sometimes was a hard conversation to have, even from my perspective. But at the end of the day, it's all about reaching your full potential and finding that joy and peace. And a lot of people don't think they can get joy and peace at work. And I completely disagree with that. I would love to hear what's coming up in your business. What are you excited about in terms of closing out the year? And then what do you have thoughts of what you're heading into for next year? Yeah, I... So I've always been a part of bigger teams. So to be an entrepreneur on your own is unique for me. What I've been missing in my practice and what I'm leaning toward growing for the remainder of this year and next year is working with companies who need that external partner to come in because their leaders are being tasked so much with just the day-to-day that they don't have a succession plan. They don't have a bench. They have a demographic of baby boomers who are retiring in the next two to three years. That is industry knowledge walking out the door. So how can I help you, your HR team, your people team, help you make your talent and succession and people programs successful? So that's what I'm really focused on going into next year is how can I make a bigger impact with more teams from a coaching perspective and a human performance lens. Thank you for sharing that. And I know you put out a lot of content in your own social media. Where can people follow you or come connect if they want to chat with you further? So LinkedIn is really the best place. That's a good place to reach out to me, to get to know my posts and what seems to matter with my clients and what's top of mind for my clients. So definitely LinkedIn. I do have a Facebook page as well. Some of my clients are more on Facebook than, or there's some industries that are not on LinkedIn at all, but I would say LinkedIn is the best place to reach. 